Two Treatises of Civil Government by John Locke. Book One, Chapter Eleven. Who Air? Part Three. Our author, to make good the title of his book, page thirteen, begins his history of the descent of Adam's regal power, page thirteen, in these words. This lordship, which Adam by command had over the whole world, and by right descending from him the patriarchs did enjoy, was a large, etc. How does he prove that the patriarchs by descent did enjoy it? For dominion of life and death, says he, we find Judah, the father, pronounced sentence of death against Tamar, his daughter-in-law, for playing the harlot. Page 13. How does this prove that Judah had absolute and sovereign authority? He pronounced sentence of death. The pronouncing of sentence of death is not a certain mark of sovereignty, but usually the office of inferior magistrates. The power of making laws of life and death is indeed a mark of sovereignty, but pronouncing the sentence according to those laws may be done by others, and therefore this will but ill prove that he had sovereign authority, as if one should say, Judge Jeffreys pronounced sentence of death in the late times, therefore Judge Jeffreys had sovereign authority. But it will be said, Judah did it not by commission from another, and therefore did it in his own right. Who knows whether he had any right at all? Heat of passion might carry him to do that which he had no authority to do. Judah had dominion of life and death. How does that appear? He exercised it. He pronounced sentence of death against Tamar. Our author thinks it a very good proof that because he did it, therefore he had a right to do it. He lay with her also. By the same way of proof he had a right to do that too. If the consequence be good from doing to a right of doing, Absalom too may be reckoned amongst our author's sovereigns, for he pronounced such a sentence of death against his brother Amnon, and much upon a like occasion, and had it executed too, if that be sufficient to prove a dominion of life and death. But allowing this all to be clear demonstration of sovereign power, who was it that had this lordship by right descending to him from Adam, as large and ample as the absolutest dominion of any monarch? Judah, says our author, Judah, a younger son of Jacob, his father and elder brethren living. So that if our author's own proof be to be taken, a younger brother may, in the life of his father and elder brothers, by right of descent, enjoy Adam's monarchical power and if one so qualified may be monarch by descent, why may not every man? If Judah, his father and elder brother living, were one of Adam's heirs, I know not who can be excluded from this inheritance. All men by inheritance may be monarchs as well as Judah. Touching war, we see that Abraham commanded an army of 318 soldiers of his own family, and Esau met his brother Jacob with 400 men-at-arms. For matter of peace, Abraham made a league with Abimelech, etc., page 13. Is it not possible for a man to have 318 men in his family without being heir to Adam? A planter in the West Indies has more, and might, if he pleased, who doubts, muster them up and lead them out against the Indians to seek reparation upon any injury received from them, and this without the absolute dominion of a monarch descending to him from Adam. Would it not be an admirable argument to prove that all power by God's institution descended from Adam by inheritance, and that the very person and power of this planter were the ordinance of God, because he had power in his family over servants born in his house and bought with his money? For this was just Abraham's case. Those who were rich in the patriarch's days, as in the West Indies now, bought men and maid servants, and by their increase, as well as purchasing of new, came to have large and numerous families, which, though they made use of in war or peace, can it be thought the power they had over them was an inheritance descended from Adam, when it was the purchase of their money? A man's riding in an expedition against an enemy, his horse bought in a fair, would be as good a proof that the owner enjoyed the lordship which Adam by command had over the whole world, by right descending to him, 
as Abraham's leading out the servants of his family, is that the patriarchs enjoyed this lordship by descent from Adam. Since the title to the power the master had in both cases, whether over slaves or horses, was only from his purchase, and the getting a dominion over anything by bargain and money is a new way of proving one had it by descent and inheritance. But making war and peace are marks of sovereignty. Let it be so in politic societies. May not, therefore, a man in the West Indies, who hath with him sons of his own, friends or companions, soldiers under pay, or slaves bought with money, or perhaps a band made up of all these, make war and peace, if there should be occasion, and ratify the articles too with an oath, without being a sovereign, an absolute king over those who went with him. He that says he cannot, must then allow many masters of ships, many private planters, to be absolute monarchs, for as much as this they have done. War and peace cannot be made for politic societies, but by the supreme power of such societies, because war and peace, giving a different motion to the force of such a politic body, none can make war or peace, but that which has the direction of the force of the whole body, and that, in politic societies, is only the supreme power. In voluntary societies for the time, he that has such a power by consent may make war and peace, and so may a single man for himself, the state of war not consisting in the number of partisans, but the enmity of the parties, where they have no superior to appeal to. The actual making of war or peace is no proof of any other power but only of disposing those to exercise or cease acts of enmity for whom he makes it. And this power, in many cases, any one may have without any politic supremacy, and therefore the making of war or peace will not prove that every one that does so is a politic ruler, much less a king. For then commonwealths must be kings too, for they do as certainly make war and peace as monarchical government. But granting this a mark of sovereignty in Abraham, is it a proof of the descent to him of Adam's sovereignty over the whole world? If it be, it will surely be as good a proof of the descent of Adam's lordship to others too. And then commonwealths, as well as Abraham, will be heirs of Adam, for they make war and peace as well as he. If you say that the lordship of Adam doth not by right descend to commonwealths, though they make war and peace, the same say I of Abraham, and then there is an end of your argument. If you stand to your argument, and say, those that do make war and peace, as commonwealths do without doubt, do inherit Adam's lordship, there is an end of your monarchy. Unless you will say that commonwealths, by descent enjoying Adam's lordship, are monarchies, and that indeed would be a new way of making all the governments in the world monarchical. To give our author the honour of this new invention, for I confess it is not I have first found it out by tracing his principles and so charged it on him, it is fit my readers know that, as absurd as it may seem, he teaches it himself, page 23, where he ingenuously says, In all kingdoms and commonwealths in the world, whether the prince be the supreme father of the people, or but the true heir to such a father, or come to the crown by usurpation or election, or whether some few or a multitude govern the commonwealth, yet still the authority that is in any one, or in many, or in all these, is the only right and natural authority of a supreme father. Which right of fatherhood, he often tells us, is regal and royal authority, as particularly page 12, the page immediately preceding this instance of Abraham. This regal authority, he says, those that govern commonwealths have. And if it be true that regal and royal authority be in those that govern commonwealths, it is as true that commonwealths are governed by kings. For if regal authority be in him that governs, he that governs must needs be a king. And so all commonwealths are nothing but downright monarchies, and then what need any more ado about the matter? The governments of the world are as they should be, there is nothing but monarchy in it. This, without doubt, was the surest way our author could have found to turn all other governments but monarchical out of the world. 
but all this scarce proves Abraham to have been a king as heir to Adam. If by inheritance he had been king, Lot, who was of the same family, must needs have been his subject, by that title, before the servants in his family. But we see they lived as friends and equals, and when their herdsmen could not agree, there was no pretense of jurisdiction or superiority between them, but they parted by consent. Genesis 13. Hence he is called, both by Abraham and by the text, Abraham's brother, the name of friendship and equality, and not of jurisdiction and authority, though he were really but his nephew. And if our author knows that Abraham was Adam's heir and a king, it was more, it seems, than Abraham himself knew, or his servant whom he sent a wooing for his son, for when he sets out the advantages of the match, 24 Genesis 35, thereby to prevail with the young woman and her friends, he says, I am Abraham's servant, and the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold, and men servants and maid servants, and camels and asses, and Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all he hath. Can one think that a discreet servant, that was thus particular to set out his master's greatness, would have omitted the crown Isaac was to have, if he had known of any such? Can it be imagined he should have neglected to have told them, on such an occasion as this, that Abraham was a king, a name well known at that time, for he had nine of them his neighbours? If he or his master had thought any such thing, the likeliest matter of all the rest to make his errand successful. But this discovery, it seems, was reserved for our author to make, two or three thousand years after and let him enjoy the credit of it. Only he should have taken care that some of Adam's land should have descended to this his heir, as well as all Adam's lordship. For though this lordship which Abraham, if we may believe our author, as well as the other patriarchs, by right descending to him, did enjoy, was as large and ample as the absolutest dominion of any monarch which hath been since the creation, yet his estate, his territories, his dominions— were very narrow and scanty, for he had not the possession of a foot of land till he bought a field and a cave of the sons of Heth to bury Sarah in. The instance of Esau, joined with this of Abraham, to prove that the lordship which Adam had over the whole world, by right descending from him the patriarchs did enjoy, is yet more pleasant than the former. Esau met his brother Jacob with four hundred men-at-arms, he therefore was a king, by right of heir to Adam. Four hundred armed men, then, however got together, are enough to prove him that leads them to be a king and Adam's heir. There have been Tories in Ireland, whatever there are in other countries, who would have thanked our author for so honourable an opinion of them, especially if there had been nobody near with a better title of five hundred armed men to question their royal authority of four hundred. It is a shame for men to trifle so, to say no worse of it, in so serious an argument. Here Esau is brought as a proof that Adam's lordship, Adam's absolute dominion, as large as that of any monarch, descended by right to the patriarchs. And in this very chapter, page 19, Jacob is brought as an instance of one that by birthright was lord over his brethren. So we have here two brothers, absolute monarchs, by the same title, and at the same time heirs to Adam, the eldest heir to Adam because he met his brother with four hundred men, and the youngest heir to Adam by birthright. Esau enjoyed the lordship which Adam had over the whole world, by right descending to him, in as large and ample manner as the absolutist dominion of any monarch, and at the same time Jacob lord over him by the right heirs have to be lords over their brethren. Risum teneatis. I never, I confess, met with any man of parts so dexterous as Sir Robert at this way of arguing, but it was his misfortune to light upon an hypothesis that could not be accommodated to the nature of things, and human affairs. His principles could not be made to agree with that constitution and order which God had settled in the world, and therefore must needs often clash with common sense and experience. In the next section he tells us, 
This patriarchal power continued not only till the flood, but after it, as the name patriarch doth in part prove. The word patriarch doth more than in part prove that patriarchal power continued in the world as long as they were patriarchs, for it is necessary that patriarchal power should be whilst there are patriarchs, as it is necessary that there should be paternal or conjugal power whilst there are fathers or husbands, but this is but playing with names. That which he would fallaciously insinuate is the thing in question to be proved, viz. that the lordship which Adam had over the world, the supposed absolute universal dominion of Adam, by right descending from him, the patriarchs did enjoy. If he affirms such an absolute monarchy continued to the flood in the world, I would be glad to know what records he has it from, for I confess I cannot find a word of it in my Bible. If, by patriarchal power, he means anything else, it is nothing to the matter in hand. And how the name patriarch, in some part, proves that those who are called by that name had absolute monarchical power, I confess I do not see and therefore, I think, needs no answer, till the argument from it be made out a little clearer. The three sons of Noah had the world, says our author, divided amongst them by their father. For of them was the whole world overspread. Page 14. The world might be overspread by the offspring of Noah's sons, though he never divided the world amongst them, for the earth might be replenished without being divided, so that all our author's argument here proves no such division. However, I allow it to him, and then ask, the world being divided amongst them, which of the three was Adam's heir? If Adam's lordship, Adam's monarchy, by right descended only to the eldest, then the other two could be but his subjects, his slaves. If by right it descended to all three brothers, by the same right it will descend to all mankind, and then it will be impossible, what he says, page 19, that heirs are lords of their brethren, should be true. But all brothers, and consequently all men, will be equal and independent, all heirs to Adam's monarchy, and consequently all monarchs too, one as much as another. But it will be said, Noah their father divided the world amongst them, so that our author will allow more to Noah than he will to God Almighty. For, observations two one one, he thought it hard that God himself should give the world to Noah and his sons to the prejudice of Noah's birthright. His words are, Noah was left sole heir to the world. Why should it be thought that God would disinherit him out of his birthright, and make him of all men in the world the only tenant in common with his children? And yet here he thinks it fit that Noah should disinherit Shem of his birthright, and divide the world betwixt him and his brethren. So that this birthright, when our author pleases, must, and when he pleases, must not, be sacred and inviolable. If Noah did divide the world between his sons, and his assignment of dominions to them were good, there is an end of divine institution. All our author's discourse of Adam's heir, with whatsoever he builds on it, is quite out of doors. The natural power of kings falls to the ground, and then the form of the power governing, and the person having that power, will not be, as he says they are, observations 254, the ordinance of God, but they will be ordinances of man. For if the right of the heir be the ordinance of God, a divine right, no man, father or not father, can alter it. If it be not a divine right, it is only human, depending on the will of man. And so where human institution gives it not, the firstborn has no right at all above his brethren, and men may put government into what hands and under what form they please. He goes on. Most of the civilest nations of the earth labour to fetch their original from some of the sons or nephews of Noah. Page 14. How many do most of the civilist nations amount to? And who are they? I fear the Chineses, a very great and civil people, as well as several other people of the East, West, North, and South, trouble not themselves much about this matter. 
all that believe the Bible, which I believe are our authors, most of the civilist nations, must necessarily derive themselves from Noah. But for the rest of the world, they think little of his sons or nephews. But if the heralds and antiquaries of all nations, for it is these men generally that labour to find out the originals of nations, or all the nations themselves, should labour to fetch their original from some of the sons or nephews of Noah, what would this be to prove that the lordship which Adam had over the whole world by right descended to the patriarchs? Whoever, nations or races of men, labour to fetch their original from, may be concluded to be thought by them men of renown, famous to posterity, for the greatness of the virtues and actions. But beyond these they look not, nor consider who they were heirs to, but look on them as such as raised themselves by their own virtue, to a degree that would give a lustre to those who, in future ages, could pretend to derive themselves from them. But if it were Ogyges, Hercules, Brahma, Tamberlin, Faramond, nay, if Jupiter and Saturn were the names from whence diverse races of men, both ancient and modern, have laboured to derive their original, will that prove that those men enjoyed the lordship of Adam by right descending to them? If not, this is but a flourish of our authors to mislead his reader, that in itself signifies nothing. To as much purpose is what he tells us, page 15, concerning this division of the world, that some say it was by lot, and others that Noah sailed round the Mediterranean in ten years, and divided the world into Asia, Africa, and Europe, portions for his three sons. America, then, it seems, was left to be his that could catch it. Why our author takes such pains to prove the division of the world by Noah to his sons, and will not leave out an imagination, though no better than a dream, that he can find anywhere to favour it, is hard to guess, since such a division, if it prove anything, must necessarily take away the title of Adam's heir, unless three brothers can all together be heirs of Adam, and therefore the following words, Howsoever the manner of this division be uncertain, yet it is most certain the division itself was by families from Noah and his children, over which the parents were heads and princes, page 15, if allowed him to be true, and of any force to prove that all the power in the world is nothing but the lordship of Adams descending by right, they will only prove that the fathers of the children are all heirs to this lordship of Adam. For if in those days Ham and Japhet and other parents, besides the eldest son, were heads and princes over their families, and had a right to divide the earth by families, what hinders younger brothers being fathers of families from having the same right? If Ham and Japhet were princes by right descending to them, notwithstanding any title of heir in their eldest brother, younger brothers by the same right descending to them are princes now. And so all our author's natural power of kings will reach no farther than their own children, and no kingdom, by this natural right, can be bigger than a family. For either this lordship of Adam over the whole world, by right, descends only to the eldest son, and then there can be but one heir, as our author says, page 19, or else it by right descends to all the sons equally, and then every father of a family will have it, as well as the three sons of Noah. Take which you will, it destroys the present governments and kingdoms that are now in the world, since whoever has this natural power of a king, by right descending to him, must have it, either, as our author tells us Cain had it, and be lord over his brethren, and so be alone king of the whole world, or else, as he tells us here, Shem, Ham, and Japheth had it, three brothers, and so be only prince of his own family, and all families independent one of another. All the world must be only one empire by the right of the next heir, or else every family be a distinct government of itself, by the lordship of Adams descending to parents of families. And to this only tend all the proofs he here gives us of the descent of Adams' lordship. For continuing his story of this descent, he says, In the dispersion of Babel, we must certainly find the establishment of royal power throughout the kingdoms of the world. Page 14. 
if you must find it, pray do, and you will help us to a new piece of history. But you must show it us, before we shall be bound to believe, that regal power was established in the world upon your principles. For that regal power was established in the kingdoms of the world, I think nobody will dispute. But that there should be kingdoms in the world, whose several kings enjoyed their crowns by right descending to them from Adam, that we think not only apocryphal, but also utterly impossible. If our author has no better foundation for his monarchy than a supposition of what was done at the dispersion of Babel, the monarchy he erects thereon, whose top is to reach to heaven to unite mankind, will serve only to divide and scatter them as that tower did, and instead of establishing civil government and order in the world, will produce nothing but confusion. For he tells us, the nations that they were divided into were distinct families which had fathers for rulers over them, whereby it appears that even in the confusion God was careful to preserve the fatherly authority by distributing the diversity of languages according to the diversity of families. Page 14. It would have been a hard matter for any one but our author to have found out so plainly, in the text he here brings, that all the nations in that dispersion were governed by fathers, and that God was careful to preserve the fatherly authority. The words of the text are, These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues in their lands, after their nations. And the same thing is said of Ham and Japheth, after an enumeration of their posterities, in all which there is not one word said of their governors or forms of government, of fathers or fatherly authority. But our author, who is very quick-sighted to spy out fatherhood, where nobody else could see any the least glimpses of it, tells us positively their rulers were fathers, and God was careful to preserve the fatherly authority. And why? Because those of the same family spoke the same language, and so of necessity in the division kept together. Just as if one should argue thus, Hannibal, in his army, consisting of diverse nations, kept those of the same language together. Therefore fathers were captains of each band, and Hannibal was careful of the fatherly authority. Or in peopling of Carolina, the English, French, Scotch, and Welsh that are there plant themselves together, and by them the country is divided in their lands, after their tongues, after their families, after their nations. Therefore care was taken of the fatherly authority. Or because in many parts of America every little tribe was a distinct people with a different language, one should infer that therefore God was careful to preserve the fatherly authority, or that therefore their rulers enjoyed Adam's lordship by right descending to them. Though we know not who were their governors, nor what their form of government, but only that they were divided into little independent societies speaking different languages. The scripture says not a word of their rulers or forms of government, but only gives an account how mankind came to be divided into distinct languages and nations. And therefore it is not to argue from the authority of scripture to tell us positively fathers were their rulers, when the scripture says no such thing, but to set up fancies of one's own brain, when we confidently aver matter of fact where records are utterly silent. Upon a like ground, i.e. none at all, he says that there were not confused multitudes without heads and governors, and at liberty to choose what governors or governments they pleased. For I demand, when mankind were all yet of one language, all congregated in the plain of Shinar, were they then all under one monarch, who enjoyed the lordship of Adam by right descending to him? If they were not, there were then no thoughts, it is plain, of Adam's heir, no right to government known then upon that title, no care taken by God or man of Adam's fatherly authority. If, when mankind were but one people, dwelt altogether and were of one language, and were upon building a city together, and when it was plain that they could not but know the right heir, for Shem lived till Isaac's time, a long while after the division at Babel, if then, I say, they were not under the monarchical government of Adam's fatherhood, by right descending to the heir, 
it is plain there was no regard had to the fatherhood, no monarchy acknowledged due to Adam's heir, no empire of Shems in Asia, and consequently no such division of the world by Noah as our author has talked of. As far as we can conclude anything from Scripture in this matter, it seems from this place that, if they had any government, it was rather a commonwealth than an absolute monarchy. For the Scripture tells us, Genesis 11, they said, It was not a prince commanded the building of this city and tower. It was not by the command of one monarch, but by the consultation of many, a free people. Let us build us a city. They built it for themselves as free men, not as slaves for their lord and master, that we be not scattered abroad, having a city once built, and fixed habitations to settle our abodes and families. This was the consultation and design of a people that were at liberty to pass asunder, but desired to keep in one body, and could not have been either necessary or likely in men tied together under the government of one monarch, who if they had been, as our author tells us, all slaves under the absolute dominion of a monarch, needed not have taken such care to hinder themselves from wandering out of the reach of his dominion. I demand whether this be not plainer in Scripture than anything of Adam's heir or fatherly authority. But if being, as God says, Genesis 11.6, one people, they had one ruler, one king by natural right, absolute and supreme over them, what care had God to preserve the paternal authority of the supreme fatherhood, if on a sudden he suffer seventy-two, for so many our author talks of, distinct nations to be erected out of it, under distinct governors, and at once to withdraw themselves from the obedience of their sovereign? This is to entitle God's care, how and to what we please. Can it be sense to say that God was careful to preserve the fatherly authority, in those who had it not? For if these were subjects under a supreme prince, what authority had they? Was it an instance of God's care to preserve the fatherly authority when he took away the true supreme fatherhood of the natural monarch? Can it be reason to say that God, for the preservation of fatherly authority, lets several new governments with their governors start up who could not all have fatherly authority? And is it not as much reason to say that God is careful to destroy fatherly authority when he suffers one who is in possession of it to have his government torn in pieces and shared by several of his subjects? Would it not be an argument just like this for monarchical government to say when any monarchy was shattered to pieces and divided amongst revolted subjects that God was careful to preserve monarchical power by rending a settled empire into a multitude of little governments. If any one will say that what happens in providence to be preserved, God is careful to preserve, as a thing therefore to be esteemed by men as necessary or useful, it is a peculiar propriety of speech, which every one will not think fit to imitate. But this, I am sure, is impossible to be either proper or true speaking, that Shem, for example, for he was then alive, should have fatherly authority, or sovereignty by right of fatherhood, over that one people at Babel, and that the next moment, Shem yet living, seventy-two others should have fatherly authority, or sovereignty by right of fatherhood, over the same people, divided into so many distinct governments. Either these seventy-two fathers actually were rulers, just before the confusion, and then they were not one people, but that God himself says they were, or else they were a commonwealth, and then where was monarchy? Or else these seventy-two fathers had fatherly authority, but knew it not. Strange that fatherly authority should be the only original of government amongst men, and yet all mankind not know it. And stranger yet that the confusion of tongues should reveal it to them all of a sudden, and in an instant these seventy-two should know that they had fatherly power, and all others know that they were to obey it in them, and every one know that particular fatherly authority to which he was a subject. He that can think this, arguing from Scripture, may from thence make out what model of an utopia will best suit with his fancy or interest, and this fatherhood thus disposed of will justify both a prince who claims an universal monarchy, 
and his subjects, who, being fathers of families, shall quit all subjection to him, and cant on his empire into less governments for themselves. For it will always remain a doubt, in which of these the fatherly authority resided, till our author resolves us whether Shem, who was then alive, or these seventy-two new princes, beginning so many new empires in his dominions and over his subjects, had right to govern. Since our author tells us that both one and the other had fatherly, which is supreme, authority, and are brought in by him as instances of those who did enjoy the lordship of Adam by right descending to them, which was as large and ample as the absolutest dominion of any monarch. This at least is unavoidable, that if God was careful to preserve the fatherly authority in the seventy-two new erected nations, it necessarily follows that he was as careful to destroy all pretenses of Adam's heir, since he took care, and therefore did preserve, the fatherly authority in so many, at least seventy-one, that could not possibly be Adam's heirs, when the right heir, if God had ever ordained any such inheritance, could not but be known, Shem then living, and they being all one people. End of chapter 11, part 3